We're going to see tonight Jesus begins to break off those seals from the scroll. Pastor Lance introduced us to that last last week. A double-sided scroll, text on both sides, full of the visions that John is about to witness, sealed with seven seals. And as we learned last week, it's really a picture of a, a special type of a scroll, a title deed to property. Not just a title deed, it's more of a lease agreement with an expiration date. Because in the, in the law of Moses, land deals are, are not permanent. They're temporary leases. Because after 49 years and upon the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, all land is returned to the original owners or the original families. And so every seal on that title deed represents a block of time that passes. And when the final seal is broken, the lease is up and the land reverts back to its original owner. And that's what we see in Revelation. Jesus preparing to reclaim the earth for his own. So here in Revelation 6, the scroll has been handed over to Jesus And by the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus is going to reclaim this planet as his own. Oh, you didn't hear me. (laughs) By the end of Revelation, Jesus is going to reclaim this planet as his own. That's good. That's good. He's going to reclaim what Adam lost as he failed in the garden. The planet will be back under Jesus' dominion and authority. The power of sin, finally broken. Humankind returned to perfect fellowship with God. And here's the best part. The glory will be returned. The glory departed in Adam's sin, but Jesus will return that glory. Indeed, he's already returning that glory. As believers in the new life that we have in Christ, we're already being conformed to the image of Christ from glory to glory, from day to day. But when Jesus comes and reclaims the planet, we'll we'll see perfectly that we are reflecting his glory once again. Just as we were made in his image, we will now reflect that image properly. So I wanted to say all of that for this reason. When we get into now Revelation 6, things get very unpleasant. Things are going to get gnarly. Next week when we get to chapter 8, it's brutal. And we're going to see chapter after chapter after chapter of some really heavy stuff. Even though these disasters, the wrath being poured out in Revelation is really hard to stomach, I'd suggest don't eat a big dinner before you come. Go light, okay? It's going to get pretty gross. Don't forget what lies at the end of this Our world totally restored to Jesus. The story told in Revelation is actually good news. Sounds like bad news, but indeed is good news. In fact, I was just reflecting on this. I want to read this now as we go, go to the Lord in prayer. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. Blessed is he who reads. Strives to understand, tries to live this out. There's a blessing in this. This is good news. We have to go through some chapters of heavy things, but let's not forget what lies at the end of this. I'm going to ask you just for a moment to stand with me as we pray. Lord, we want to stand just for a moment and recognize that you are King of Kings. We stand in your presence. We honor you as our sovereign Lord. We set you on high in our hearts tonight as King of Kings. We're not waiting for your return at the end of time. Lord, you are Lord and you are King and you are our God tonight. And we surrender ourselves to you completely. And Lord, we do pray for that blessing that is received by those who read the words of Revelation. And Lord, we thank you for the good news that this is pointing to, that Jesus, you will come and you will reclaim this planet for your own. You will restore the glory. Thank you, Lord, for this good news. Amen. All right, have a seat, please. 
Something we mention almost every week as we study Revelation is this overall question, how do you interpret this book? Different Christian groups and denominations and churches historically have had different interpretations of Revelation. I believe Pastor Lance outlined those for us. Or maybe it was Jordan. I think Jordan outlined those for us, our first study in Revelation. And so these visions might seem very esoteric, maybe open to subjective interpretation as you read these visions. You're like, well, to me it means this, and, to, you know, and everyone can kind of have their own interpretation. But I want you to realize something. As John is delivering to us the vision of the revelation of Jesus Christ, he isn't making up new material that has to be decoded all on its own. The visions of Revelation have been seen before in Scripture. We've told you before, when you study Revelation, better keep your thumb in the Old Testament because there's so many allusions and connections between the Old Testament and Revelation. But it, there's something else that we need to remember as well. Some of these visions, some of these, these, they seem so mystical to us, this isn't the first time we've seen them. For example, the Antichrist. The abomination of the desolation was described in the book of Daniel. And Paul speaks of this as well in Thessalonians. John isn't coming up with something brand new in Revelation. As we see these seals broken in chapter 6, you did turn to Revelation 6, right? You're there. Okay. We're going to see seven seals beginning to break open as we've, as we've, as we've described now. Understand that these are the same events that Jesus teaches his disciples of in Matthew 24. John isn't creating some whole brand new scenario that we need to kind of interpret on our own. Jesus has already told us what the last days will look like. So I'm going to invite you tonight to keep a finger in Matthew 24. Edwin, go ahead and shoot up this, the next slide for us. I have an outline real quick. I know you can't read it. Don't panic quick outline. We're going to go point by point with, with I don't know, it'll blow up. We're going to blow up each of these points into a big screen so you can see it. But just real quick, notice this. We have the seals, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth seal. And, and just a quick, you know, picture what that seal is about. First seal is going to talk about conquest or a conqueror. The second seal will describe war, worldwide war. Third seal, famine, economic disasters. I see people trying to take pictures of the screen. Trust me, I'm going to make it bigger for you. I will. I just want to see the, this, the whole picture now. The fourth seal, death. The fifth seal, the martyrdom of the saints. The sixth seal, natural disasters, stellar disasters, signs in the heavens. The seventh seal, which we won't really go into depth in until Revelation chapter 8 but we'll see divine judgment. But here's the thing. Jesus speaks of these things in Matthew 24. He speaks of a conqueror. He speaks of deceiving, the deceiving Antichrist and the false prophets. He speaks of wars and rumors of wars in Matthew 24. He speaks of famine and pestilence. He says about death that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. So much death that God would have to stop the tribulation for any hope of any human life to survive. And Jesus, of course, speaks of martyrdom, warning his followers that they would be delivered up to tribulation. He speaks of natural disasters in Matthew 24, that the sun and the moon would be darkened and stars would fall from the sky. And then Jesus in Matthew 24 begins to tell parables of an impending judgment, the day of the Lord coming. He speaks of parables of a returning master. And people need to be ready and prepared for that. So, as we study through Revelation 6 tonight, I will be jumping to Matthew 24. We're going to read a lot of Matthew 24 tonight. So be prepared to jump back and forth. All right, let's get to the text. Chapter 6, verse 1, Revelation. Now, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Let's review back to a couple Sundays ago. Why is this Lamb, who is Jesus, why is he worthy to open the seals? Is it because 
he's mighty God? Is it because he's almighty God? We might think so. Maybe because he's the king of kings. Maybe because he's the lion of Judah. All these things are true of Jesus. But what John specifically says makes him worthy, or what the creatures are proclaiming makes Jesus worthy is this, because he was slain and has redeemed us to God by his blood. It's because what Jesus did on the cross to redeem us for God, that's why he's worthy to take the scroll and break open the seals. He's worthy because he died and rose again. He's worthy because of his lamb-like sacrifice for us, which is why he's both lion and lamb, the king of kings, but also the servant of all who laid down his life for all. It's important to remember when we see, we're even gonna see the phrase tonight, the wrath of the lamb. Remember what he did for us on the cross. And we keep reading. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. Come and see will be repeated before each of the four signs of the riders, the the horsemen tonight. I can understand this. Can, Can you just put yourself in John's shoes for a moment? And God shows you visions of these angelic horsemen that we're going to look at. And and they are bringing with them worldwide disasters. John would be falling on his face in fear of these things. And the angel says, John, I, I need you to take a look at this. Come and see. Don't hold back. I need you to come and see. He has to bring John into these frightening visions. Verse 2. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Let's go ahead and put up our first seal here. There it is right there. So I told you I was going to expand it for you. So we have the first seal. A white horse rider with a bow. He's a conqueror. A lot of uh, Bible commentaries will say this is just a sign of conquest, just a general idea of conquest on the earth, that nations are, are wanting to take over other nations. But we get to that with the second seal. Uh, really, what we're looking at is a specific conqueror, the same conqueror that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 24, the Antichrist. Let me explain this for a moment. Let me explain this. When you see a white horse... In Revelation, who do you expect that might be speaking of? You you might think it's Jesus. Because you know, oh yeah, Jesus rides a white horse. But when does Jesus come riding in on the white horse? At the end of the story, as a you know, to to bring the, the final judgment. No, this conqueror is different. What weapon does Jesus wield when he comes riding in on his white horse? A sword. What weapon is this rider wielding? A bow. So this is not the same. No, this conqueror is different. He's a horse archer. Now, horse archers, I have to speak about this kind of historically. Uh, They have a significant place in world history. Armies of horse archers were often unstoppable in ancient warfare. For example, think of the Mongols. The Mongols established the largest land empire in history. And what was their primary weapon? Horse archers. A thousand years before those Mongols, as John was writing in Revelation, the most notorious horse archers were the Parthians. These are the riders who came out of Persia. Now, these dudes were going, understand this, they're going head-to-head with the Romans and winning dramatic battles even when they were greatly outnumbered. It's no easy trick. Their most devastating tactic was to engage the enemy infantry and then just kind of peel away as if they were uh, running away in defeat. Like, oh gosh, these, these enemies are too much for us. They'll peel away. But as they begin to peel away, the, their enemies will begin to drop their shields and begin to run forward, breaking ranks. And at that moment, the Parthians had a devastating tactic. They were able to spin around in their, in their saddles and unleash their arrows. So the moment that their enemies would break ranks and begin to pursue 
the Parthians would let go with some deadly uh, shots. Now, this is not as easy as it sounds. Stirrups had not been invented yet. Any horse riders in here? Anybody riding horses? Nobody? Couple people? Do you know how useful stirrups are? You ever try to ride a horse without them? You have to have amazing leg strength to hold yourself onto those. That's what these guys were doing. They were wrapping their legs around the horses and gripping with all their might as they're spinning around and unleashing precise and deadly shots against the enemies. They were so effective at this ruse that it's been remembered in a term that we still use today, the Parthian shot, or some people call it the parting shot. You know when you've been in an argument with someone and you're not winning, so you just walk out, but over your shoulder you just, you know, one, you get the final word in, and then you leave before they can give you the, the, their retort. You know, that's the Parthian shot there, the parting shot. One other interesting thing, and I have to give a lot of credit to Lance on this one, he he, uh, he gave me some clues about this in, in history, so I've been enjoying looking up these guys. Their preferred horse, these Parthians, their preferred horse was the swift Persian breed. Remember, these guys are out of Persia. And there was a, a swift breed that was great for the open plains of Asia. And their favorite variety was the Appaloosa, which is a white horse with black spots. Or the Palomino, which is a, a light tan horse with a white mane and a white tail. So it's interesting that John is seeing a white horse rider with a bow. Because at the time, the Parthians were taking it to the Romans. Now, he has on his head a crown. I think we just mentioned this last week. I remember we, we heard this already. But the crown here is not a ruler's crown. It's not a diadem, but rather it's the victor's crown, the Stephanos. This is a crown that was won in competition or in battle. So this guy isn't a king by right, but rather he's seizing it by force. So most conservative Bible scholars, if they believe in the literal last days, seven-year tribulation like we teach here at Calvary, they believe this is the vision of the Antichrist. And here's why. Please turn to Matthew 24, as we've mentioned. Verses 4 and 5, Matthew 24, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, what? I am the Christ and will mislead many. There's deception going on. Look at verse 11 in Matthew 24. Many false prophets will arise and will do what? Mislead many. So not just the Antichrist is doing this, but many false prophets you can see this is a time of great deception with many people offering false hope. Influencers and politicians and entertainers and media moguls and business tycoons. Everyone has the, the, their brand of truth that they're selling to lead people astray. Look at 24, 24, Matthew 24, 24. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here's the Christ or there he is, what should you do? Do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. So even going after those believers during the tribulation, trying to turn them away from Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, don't turn there, don't turn because we're, we're still here in Matthew 24, but in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul warns us that Satan can transform himself into what? An angel of light. And his servants do the same. The Antichrist is going to deceive millions, billions perhaps. He'll seem like a, the savior that the world needs as it's suffering unimaginable chaos during the tribulation. So this Antichrist arises to give a false hope, deceiving many. Keep looking now at Matthew 24. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. Go back to 15. Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, what are you supposed to do? Head for the hills. Head for the hills. This is when things are going to get really, really bad. So John's vision, as you turn back to Revelation 6, John's vision of a bowman on a white horse certainly points us to the Antichrist. A bowman on a white horse going out swiftly to conquer, using deceit as his main tactic. Now, we often think of a white horse, must be a good guy, 
like the guy wearing the white hat in a Western, must, must be the good guy, right? The one riding the horse, maybe that's the one we should trust. He's the one, the savior, the one who's come as the good guy. But no, 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 my friends, no, no. Just because he rides the white horse, this guy is one bad guy. He's the bad guy. He's a bad dude. He rides the white horse like we see Jesus in Revelation 21, but he's just an imposter. He's an imitation. He's fooling everyone. He's going to be fooling everyone. All right, Revelation 6 now, verse 3. So what's our first sign? White horse rider with a bow. Don't forget the bow. The white horse rider with the bow. And what does he represent? The conqueror. Okay, let's get to seal number two now. And you can go ahead and put the next seal up on the, on the wall there. Verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So we have a red horse rider with a great sword. This is a vision of warfare being stirred up on the earth. Militarization. Worldwide warfare. It's a time when peace is taken from the earth. You know, you can usually enjoy a season of peace between you know, the next big event. But in, in, this, in this time, there will be no peace. It's going to be bad news, and the next day, bad news, and the next day, bad news. You're not going to open the paper and have a day where there's good news. It's going to be, it's going to be warfare, disasters every single day. Peace is taken from the earth. Now, this indicates something that we learn later, we know this about the Antichrist, is that for peace to be taken from the earth, there has to be peace upon the earth. We know this about the Antichrist, that for three and a half years, he gives people a deceptive peace. It seems like peace when actually he's orchestrating behind the scenes everything he's going to unleash. But there's going to be a time of apparent peace but that will be taken from the earth and all Hades will break out. Can I say H-E double hockey sticks up here? Yeah. All hell will break loose. There it is. The word for kill here in Greek is, is the word slaughter, butchering, violent killing. People butchering each other. This is a Greek word that's only used by John in the Bible when John describes Cain murdering Abel. A slaughter, butchering. This is the kind of killing that we see by fanatical groups around the world. Groups like ISIS or Hamas. As they relish in killing and even put it on social media Use it to shock the world. This isn't killing an enemy in battle, but terrorists going after civilians and showing it off, showing off just how brutal they can be. And John also sees that this red horse rider has a great sword. So it's a time of nation versus nation, military might, thousands being killed at one time and military actions you can turn to Matthew 24 now, verse 6 and 7. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. What does Jesus say about this time? Jesus says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Notice how Jesus says all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. There's going to be birth pangs leading up to the final day of the Lord. Even before the tribulation, the world would be feeling the tension building up. We are pre-tribulational here at Calvary Oxnard. We believe that Jesus will return for his church, the bride, before the tribulation. Amen. And if you believe that, you can say amen, because that's cool. That's really cool. Believe in the rapture, that 
will be rescued from the earth before the wrath is poured out upon the earth. But this doesn't mean that Jesus' words don't apply to us as well. Our world is going to get crazier and crazier, deadlier and deadlier as the tribulation approaches. So we have to take Jesus' words to heart. Don't be deceived and don't be troubled. All will happen just as God has planned. This was Paul's theme in, in Thessalonians as he spoke of these things. He said, don't be troubled. Don't be shaken. Can I make a little confession to you? I'm a bit of a news junkie. Anybody else here a bit of a news junkie? <sighs> Can't tell you how many days are ruined because I go to the news and I have to see what's happened in the world since yesterday. Boy, that can bum you out. Boy, that can freak you out because especially today in this, in this world we have instantaneous connections all over the world through cell phones, it seems like all the bad stuff is put on the, you know, the headlines and none of the good stuff. And we'd be overwhelmed by that. So distressed. Jesus says, don't lose heart. Don't be troubled. These things have to come to pass, but then there will be the end when Jesus returns and restores this world. Let's go now to Revelation 6, verse 5. Revelation 6, verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat! For a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. The third seal is, is famine, a black horse rider with scales. This is describing a time of major economic collapse in the world, which leads to famine. Jesus confirms this, Matthew 24, 7. Don't turn there, this is real short. And there will be famines, pestilences. Now John shows us here in Revelation 6 the impact of the famine in terms of, of bread. Bread is sort of the currency of, of this, is, is how much is this bread worth? So he says, you, you need to work a full day. That's what a denarius is worth, one day's, one day's wages. You need to work a full day for one meal consisting of basically a nice loaf of bread. You can make a pretty nice loaf of bread with wheat. But what if you need to feed your family? What if you have a whole family relying on that denarius? Then you got a problem. You can't afford the good wheat. You need the cheap wheat or the barley. The barley, that's the cheap grain. With that, he says, you could make three small meals. So one meal a day for a family of three. But how many families of three do you think there were in John's day? And there's in a lot of places in this world, most families aren't a family of three, but you have families of seven, eight, nine, ten in rural, in rural third world areas. These are going to be very lean times. Now, barley was used for food, but it was food for the poor and it was food for the animals. Uh, Jesus multiplied the loaves of what kind of bread? Do you remember in the story of the 5,000? He, he multiplied loaves of barley because that was the bread that was brought to him by the poor little boy with his, his bread and his fish. Jesus took what was offered, the barley, and made a delicious meal, but it was barley. It was the same kind of grain that you would use to feed your animals. Now, if you only have one day's work, for three little portions of barley, are you feeding your animals? No, the animals are long but slaughtered and, and gone and eaten. John says, don't harm the oil and the wine. It means it's, it's off limits. You can never afford the oil and the wine during this time. There's no luxuries available. You're living on a, you know, just a day-to-day 
on a meager income, just barely enough to survive. You're not making enough for rent. You're not making enough for a mortgage or savings. You're not making enough to feed your animal, barely enough to feed your family. You're probably living in a tent or under a tarp, and you're getting hungrier each day. One of the worst economic collapses in recent history was Germany after World War I. For a lot of reasons, I'm not going to go into all the reasons behind this, but just consider the economic collapse. In 1914, a German mark, which is, I guess, their version of the dollar, four German marks to one U.S. dollar. So, four German marks to a U.S. dollar. By 1918, it was eight marks to a dollar. So, the value has been cut in half. By 1919, it's 48 marks to a U.S. dollar. How's your savings doing at this point? By 1922, 320 marks to a U.S. dollar. By the end of 1922, check this out, 7,400 marks to a dollar. That's less than a fraction of a cent per mark. But then, by 1923... Hold on to your hats. Four trillion marks to a dollar. Four trillion marks to a dollar. If you got paid, you'd have to throw all of that cash, and they were making these denominations of of millions, a, a, a mark with, you know, a German mark worth millions of marks. You throw them in your wheelbarrow, you run to the grocery store, and you hopefully buy something before the prices shoot up beyond your Ability to buy something. Forget putting it in the bank. Truly, at that case, the money was not worth the paper it was printed on. The paper itself was more valuable than the value of the money. More recently, Venezuela has, has seen unbelievable inflation. They had 274% inflation in 2016. 863% inflation in 2017. By late in that year... 2017, that wasn't that long ago, stores stopped using price tags because the minute they put a price tag on something, it was already way past that in price. They couldn't put the prices on it fast enough. So you just have to go up to the cashier and ask, what is this worth now? Let me give you a little estimate. At that point, the best way to make money in Venezuela was, check this out, in video games. One of the, the, one of the only ways to survive is go into these video games where you could mine virtual gold and tr- trade it for virtual money online, other currencies. By 2018, inflation was 130,000%. In 2019, it was 10 million percent. Overall, 53 million percent inflation from 2016 to 2019. How did your savings do at that point? What can you buy with that money that you had in 2016? Now, those inflationary disasters were regional. Germany, Venezuela. It was limited to a national currency. You had one currency that just collapsed. Maybe people could buy and trade in in other national currencies or, like I said, online. But imagine now something like this on a worldwide scale where all of the money, all of the wealth, suffers this economic collapse. Okay, that was scary. Let's go on to the next one. The fourth seal. The fourth seal. You think that one was scary? Check this one out. Now we have death. A pale rider, or uh, the rider of a pale horse, with death following in his wake. Let's read Revelation 6, verses 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal... I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and by beasts of the earth. Let's start with the color here. It says pale. It's kind of our English word that kind of maybe best fits for us, but It's not really the best idea of that word in Greek. The Greek word is chloros. 
It's where we get our words chlorophyll or chlorine. It's often used to describe in Greek young grass. Grass that's not fully green yet, but it's yellowish or grayish green. Some suggest even that that chloros color is is sort of a semi-transparent, like a ghostly image, perhaps. So imagine this, my friends, as we see pale, a pale horse. It's more like a pale green and kind of ghastly, kind of ghastly pale green, a yellowish, grayish green color. One commentator calls it the color of corpses. You remember that scene in Lord of the Rings when Frodo falls into the, and all the, all the dead bodies, I still get, I get creeped out by all those dead bodies there. It says Hades is following after the writer. Hades is a Greek term uh, used, by the, used by the Greeks as, as the, just the general place for the dead or the grave. It's not necessarily hell in every, in every sense that we use that word. So John is basically seeing death in the wake of that pale horse. Wherever that pale horse rides, death follows after him. Graves receiving bodies wherever he rides. And it says that death, death in Hades is given authority over a fourth of the earth through, really, it's just all the causes we've read of already, war, famine, killing, natural causes, beasts of the earth. Now, this doesn't mean that they're all killed at once, but just in general, through this whole tribulation time, people are dying of all of these causes, and this death rider has been given authority in, in that area. Jesus speaks of this, Matthew 24 again. Uh, go ahead and turn back to Matthew 24. I already read this one, but verse 7 says, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So there's the famines. But look at verses 21 and 22. 21 and 22. Matthew 24, 20, 21 and 22. For there will be great tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this, this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So Jesus in Matthew speaks of a time of great death. The, the real time, as we understand the, the sequence in the tribulation, is, is that most of this will happen during the second half of the tribulation, during those second three and a half years. And if God was to let that period of time continue, all life on the planet would be exterminated. This is death and destruction on a huge global scale. The coming tribulation is going to be greater, Jesus says, than any other time of upheaval ever experienced on the earth. More than the Black Plague, more than the Spanish Flu, more than the Great Depression of the 30s, more than World War I, more than even the greatest death event in human history, World War II. There's something here which I need to point out now that's key to, to interpreting Revelation. As Jesus describes the events in Matthew 24, and as John describes these events with each seal in Revelation 6, these events are worldwide, are they not? This is worldwide calamity that we read of, Right? Hello? Yes? These are not just local events. You see, our preterist friends want to interpret Revelation in a local sense. That these things just applied to the area of Israel, to, to really specifically Judah, Jerusalem, as Rome attacked, eventually destroying the city in 70 AD and leveling the temple. And so they, they want to interpret all of Revelation in those terms of just that local battle that happened between Rome and Judah. If Jesus was simply describing something on that scale, he wouldn't say nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He would have said a nation would rise against Judah or something like that. But he's talking about a worldwide war, something only possible since the modern age of transportation when you can send your armies across the globe on ships and airplanes and trains. 
So I think our preterist friends aren't quite understanding now the, the scope of this. It's worldwide. Jesus says there's going to be earthquakes and famines and pestilences in various places. And there will be wars and rumors of wars. You're going to be hearing of wars far away, rumors of wars. If you try to connect John's visions and Jesus' words in Matthew 24 and these passages to actual events in the first century, you're going to be totally stumped. What do these things mean? Where do they line up? Where's, where are those events from 70 AD in, in here? And it's total guesswork. You know, the general Titus was, the, was in charge of the armies that invaded Jerusalem in 70 AD. That attack on Jerusalem, I, I read about it this, this week. Just, you know, I, I want to go back and read what, what happened there in 70 AD. It was bad, but it would not even make the top 1,000 worst military events in history. It, it wouldn't even scratch the surface of, of, of bad military events. It was bad locally, but it wasn't on the scale that we read of. It just wouldn't work. All right, let's go to seal number five. Back to Revelation 6. I'm glad you keep your fingers in both places. Revelation 6. Verse 9, we have our fifth seal now. We're done with the riders. No more horse riders to freak you out. But this might even be worse. Now we have martyrs, martyrs. Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So we see their blood, the blood of the martyrs being poured out, but it's poured out, strangely enough, under the altar. Well, which altar is he seeing? We're going to find the answer to that in chapter 8, but let me tell you right now which altar it is. It's the altar of incense. It represents the prayers that ascend to God in the, t in the temple and in the tabernacle. The, the, the smaller altar of incense that would be burning with special scents and would be going up and rising up. That's the altar that John is seeing because the blood is crying out to God. The blood that's been spilled, the martyr's blood, cries out to God for uh, for, for God's vengeance. In the Old Testament sacrifices, the blood of the sacrifices were poured out under the large altar out in the courtyard. This is different now. It's poured out under the prayer altar. They're crying out for God's, God to avenge them. You know, the best picture we have of this is at the very beginning of the Bible, in the story of Cain and Abel. What happens? After Cain kills Abel, God comes to confront him. The Lord says to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? And says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And God says to Cain, now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. From God's perspective, the ground is a permanent record of the blood that has been spilled on it. God never forgets. Psalm 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. How much more precious is the death of those saints who die as martyrs for his testimony? Now back in Matthew 24, as you flip there, with your thumb conveniently located, verse 9, verse 9 then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. It's a time now of, of martyrdom when the followers of God and those who turn to God during the tribulation, as Pastor Lance taught on Sunday, as those 144,000 Jewish evangelists who's, who've now turned to Christ, in the tribulation, as they go out witnessing and, and they're, 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 they're bringing forth this great revival, people turning to Jesus, those people are now targeted for death. They're targeted. 
There's going to be millions, hopefully millions, coming to Jesus around the globe. And the, the Antichrist, we learn in Revelation 13, he's going to war against them. Warring against the followers of God. So here's just a wild question. Genocide? Really? In this modern world that we live in? This, moral, this modern progressive world? Surely we can't have genocide anymore, right? What about a, a, a worldwide genocide against the followers of Jesus? Could a single charismatic world leader turn everyone against one particular group of people and call for their extermination? Surely nothing like that could ever happen, right? Surely. Wrong, of course. We saw that 1930s and into the 40s as Hitler convinced good, moral, civilized German people to report on their neighbors and then look the other way as they were loaded into cattle cars and hauled off to death camps to be exterminated. It wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. There's people alive today who remember it. You see, when you blame every problem in your society on a certain group, a certain religion, a certain race of people, you can quickly spin up a genocide. We've seen this over and over in history from Christians in the first century to Jews in every century, it seems like. In the tribulation, it's going to be both the Jews and the followers of Jesus who get targeted for this. As you're in Matthew now, 24, let's read just verses 11 to 14. Let's read 11 to 14 in Matthew 24. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Deceiving many. Oh, you're going to have to deceive many people in order to stir up a genocide. But we've learned today that's easy to do. Something goes viral on social media. Some new rallying cry that spreads across the campuses. Some new political trend that promotes one group and demotes another group is dangerous. That happens. Verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The tribulation will be a cold-hearted time. I tell you what, this is a cold-hearted time. We already live in a cold-hearted time. Life is not valued. People promote themselves over others. It's a very self-centered time when how people identify you is the most important thing to so many people. How do people see me? How do people identify me? It's all about me in this society. This is a cold-hearted time. It's a selfish, self-centered time. Verse 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. This time in the tribulation is going to be so horrendous that simply holding on to God and not falling away is going to stretch people to their limits. Can you imagine waking up tomorrow with, with the threat of your faith being stretched to the breaking point where every day you just have to fall on your face before God and says, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I just need you. I just hold on to you with my, just the last ounce of my strength. Verse 14, and Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. So in the midst of that horrific tribulation, all of that death and destruction and martyrdom, the gospel is still being preached. Hallelujah. It can't be chained. It can't be chained by persecution. It can't be stopped by martyrdom. It can't be even stopped by massive worldwide disasters. In fact, it's in those things that the gospel thrives. That's how it was spread by the early church. They were persecuted. What did they do? Shut up? No. no. They, they dispersed. But as they went out, they went out preaching Jesus. And that's how the early world was turned upside down. Because of tribulation. Because of the persecution of the early church. But it says, Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. That's one of the biggest proofs that the last days are still in the future and not already fulfilled in past history because the gospel still had a long way to go in 70 AD until the ages 
of travel and com communication that we have today around where now the gospel can go to every tongue and every tribe and every nation upon the earth. Makes sense. How are we doing? We're doing good. Verse, we're in sixth seal. Sixth seal. Revelation 6 now, verse 12. Revelation 6, 12. Natural disasters. 6, 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and every island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men, and the commanders and the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? So it's not just this world system that goes totally nuts with wars and famine and economic disasters and murder and persecution. Like, a, like salt on an open wound, even heaven and earth are going to go nuts and add to the suffering and the dismay of this planet. Bummer. Bummer. It says that there will be a massive earthquake that moves mountains and coastlines, changing the map. Our world has yet to see the biggest possible earthquakes striking in the worst possible locations. But we've seen precursors and the potential disasters just beyond imagination. There's a, there's a fault that runs up from the Dead Sea up the Jordan River Valley all the way up to Turkey. In, in 1138, it produced one of the deadliest earthquakes in all of history. It was only a 7.1 magnitude earthquake but it killed over 230,000 people. A 7.1 killing 230,000 people. Well, now that's the ancient world and they didn't have the same building codes, right? They didn't build their buildings with seismic considerations. In 1976 in China, the Tangshan earthquake killed about 300,000 people. That quake measured a 7.6. So still not the most powerful but it struck in a poor, densely populated area that wasn't built to withstand an earthquake. In Haiti, just 2010, not that long ago, a 7.0 earthquake killed between, and they still don't know, 100 and 300,000 people. And it left a million people living as refugees. Haiti still hasn't recovered from that disaster. But that was just a 7.0. In 2004, most of you remember how on the day after Christmas, off the shores of Indonesia, a quake struck. Now that quake was a 9.2. That was a big one. That was a big one. But that created a massive tidal wave that killed 200,000 people. But that's just, that's almost, that's, that's the second most powerful quake ever recorded. The most powerful quake ever recorded was a 9.5 earthquake that struck in a densely populated area um, in, in Chile, I believe. But can you just imagine now, if, if you have the most powerful earthquake in a densely populated area that triggers one fault, and the next fault, and the next fault, and the next fault. You've heard of a ring of fire, right? That circles the Pacific Ocean from Chile all the way over to Japan. What if one broke loose the next, broke loose the next, broke loose? You could have the entire, you could have half the planet suffering from something like that. We also have solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, other signs of doom. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's total conjecture here to imagine what strange signs in the heavens God will send, how the sun and the moon will be darkened. Could be eclipses. Could be some other ways of darkening the sky. 
One thing that we do know very, very well, though, is the danger of meteors. Meteors, asteroids that crash into the planet. We're going to see one in Revelation 8. What is that one called? Wormwood. A giant asteroid is a well-known planet-killing scenario. If enough debris is kicked up into our atmosphere by a collision with an asteroid or a meteor, the entire ecological balance of the earth could be wrecked and life as we know it could end. Now, most killer asteroids are known. Their trajectories are charted and the possibilities of hitting the earth are, are known. And we're not too worried about those, but don't be fooled. We are regularly caught off guard between 10 and 50 small asteroids pass between the earth and the moon every year without any warning. Back in 2013, I don't know if you remember this, a 10,000 ton asteroid struck in southwest Russia. Do you remember that? It was totally unexpected because it came from the direction of the sun. So there were no sensors, no telescopes could look in that direction. It was totally hidden in the glare. That asteroid exploded with the force of about 30 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs in the atmosphere. Now, luckily, no one died, and I have no idea how that happened, but no one died. 1,500 people were injured, and it cost $33 million in repair. This can happen. This can happen. We'll read more about that when we get to Revelation chapter 8. But we have the seventh seal, which we will really not talk about tonight much. There's a few references I want to just mention in our last five minutes. The seventh seal will really be our topic for uh, Revelation chapter 8. The seal will not be open till 8. It's going to unfold in a series of trumpets and bowls and woes and other judgments of the tribulation. But we see a hint of it in verses 15 through 17. Because of those stellar signs and earthquakes and cosmic disasters, a new reality becomes clear. This is God's judgment. People are starting to become aware now that, oh, God is doing this. The sky just did something freaky. How did this happen? God must be telling us something. Everything's dark and stars are falling on us. This is God's judgment. And they say, as we read, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They are recognizing now that this is the day of the Lord, that God's judgment has come. In Matthew 24, you don't need to turn there. We're done. But Jesus in Matthew 24 then at the end, starting from verse 38, he begins a long section of parables describing the coming day of the Lord. People willfully choosing to remain ignorant and being unprepared. For example, he says, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came, and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Just like the day of judgment with Noah, the coming of the Son of Man will be the same way with people just ignorantly going through their days. In Matthew 24, then Jesus begins to tell parables. He tells a, a parable of, of a, a faithful and wise steward who's serving well when the master returns. He's made a ruler of, over all of his goods, but there's also an evil servant who sees that the master's delaying, and he beats his fellow servants. He eats and drinks with the drunkards, and he's caught totally surprised when the master returns, and the evil servant is put in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the same way, as we read here in Revelation 16, people recognizing now God's judgment, but they're refusing to surrender. They're refusing to turn to God. Instead, they're longing for death. They're crying for the mountains, mountains and caves to hide them in the rocks so that they would be saved from the wrath of the Lamb. Instead of crying out to God, they're crying out for the mountains to cover them. The irony, of course, it's the very Lamb, Jesus, who's the only rescue from God's wrath. When Jesus comes in judgment, when Jesus comes and directs God's wrath towards the sin lingering on the earth, Jesus is still the refuge from that wrath. Amen. The very same wrath. You can either run from God and fall under judgment, or you can run toward God and receive salvation and refuge from judgment. Our response 
in times of trouble should always be one thing. Repentance. Repentance. Whenever there's bad news, repentance. Whenever you're having a bad day, repentance. When this, earth, when this world goes completely nuts, one response, repentance. Repentance. 